Hello, everybody. This is your host, Aram Kumuf, and you're listening yet to another episode of the Product Innovation Show. Thank you for joining me. Uh, every week, the guests that we have on our show talk about their stories and wisdom on how to ship a great product. Today, I'm joined with Manuel Breshi. I hope I said that correctly. Uh, who is the direct Breshi? Uh-huh. Who is the Breshi. director of product at uh, Typeform? Uh, which is a no-code SaaS platform with tools that help companies grow their business by engaging with their audience. Uh, he studied at the University of Illinois, where he did his MBA and has expertise uh, in product engineering, business management, and marketing. Manuel, thank you so much for coming and sorry for screwing up your last name. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fine. In the English world, it's all, I've always been Breshi rather than Bresky. Uh, it's the Breshi. CH that is pronounced K, I, I, I guess just in Italy or something like that. So... I got used to that. <laughs> no worries. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me. Um, thank you for having me. F- first question I'll kick off with is from when I was going through your, your, your career experience and your background, I think you went from being in, from working in consulting to then entrepreneurship and then to product management. Was this kind of like part of some sort of elaborate plan or was it just kind of uh, happened this way? Well, actually, in fact, I have to say that my first job was as a product specialist for uh, the implementation of a CRM packaged application in an international pharmaceutical company. So I was just out of the university. Uh, we did a degree in IT engineering and, and I landed this very interesting job. The only thing is that I wasn't really sure how to approach it. It was very much, uh, let's say, business oriented and product oriented. And I had a technical degree, so I was, I was a bit lost. Um, consultancy actually came later on because once uh, uh, after spending some years as a product specialist for these uh, CRM international implementation, I realized that I could work uh, effectively in international markets and also expand my knowledge about enterprise software, both on customer relationship management and, and business intelligence, and also being my own boss, right? So uh, that's that's a dream for everyone, at least uh, also at, at a young age. Later in life, <laughs> not so sure. Um, and then during the period 2004, 2007, I was also attending a PhD from the Engineering University uh, of Florence, where I graduated also and I got my master in IT engineering. Um, and that paved the base for a new software. And then afterwards, I... I would have launched uh, in 2014 at Oracle Open World in San Francisco. So I would say that entrepreneurship, uh, I always had an entrepreneurship uh, mindset. Uh, given an also approach consultancy, the consultancy days as an entrepreneur, as well as a product person, because I also during consultancy, I constantly work in, in parallel on my tools software that we launched then in, uh, in San Francisco in 2014. And, and, which MVP I actually used with uh, with many clients of ours. So product management has always been there in reality. Uh, the fact is that if you go back 20 years in Europe and you ask anyone about product management, they would have answered you probably just about manufacturing and industries, not software. So in Europe, you were either you know a functional guy or a technical one. Uh, and there was project management in the middle that actually was really also a passion for me at the beginning because it was a kind of, it was not product management, but it was in any case handling the end-to-hand life cycle of a, of a product. So being an engineer and having a project management certification certainly helped. Um, and that actually is what is what I loved to be as an entrepreneur because I love building HMP products to the market, but there weren't really product management positions in Europe at the time. So you had to, to do it on your own. So one thing that I learned actually in life is that uh, you need to do your best in the contingency and constraints that you live in. Uh, And honestly, I'm proud of what I did and what I achieved. Uh, But also for this reason, uh, what I would have, yeah, I mean, maybe I would have done something different. So if you were to do something different, I mean, with everything that you know, what would you do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from a career standpoint, investing in Europe is tough. You have a much tougher uh, way ahead compared to the US. Um, hmm. I would have probably moved to the US uh, permanently in 2012. Uh, I actually had an opportunity um, at the time to join forces with an entrepreneur, a French one, French guy uh, that moved to the to the valley. Uh, but honestly, I didn't have the guts to do it. 
at that time. So a career, I would say a career in Europe and a career in the US are two totally different things, above all in product management. As I mentioned, product management was already there uh, in the valleys from the beginning of the century, to be honest. Um, so it would have been actually probably more beneficial uh, from, a, from a career standpoint. I would say that now, maybe after COVID hit and you know this new way of also working remotely has democratized the way for companies to access talent and for you know for any professional to to be able to to use their uh, you know their skills uh, in an international setting. So probably it's it's a good it's a good thing. Um, in any case, for the U.S., actually one of the reasons I attended the, the MBA and I graduated from the University of Illinois is because apart from the quality of the education itself compared to some European MBAs, I, wa- I wanted actually also to connect with, uh, with the U.S. much more. All right. So lesson is <laughs> could have stayed in the U.S., but now with everything, <laughs> you could be anywhere. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Um, I want to talk about biases. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a few different types of biases I wanted to discuss with you. Too. So first one, it's, um, well, general like decision-making bias in, in mm. product. Um, mm. So it exists. Um, what are your thoughts about how to mm. count, counter any kind of decision-making biases in product management? Well, I would say in product management, you have the same biases that you have uh, also in life, personally, um, I mean, in general, the most common ones is uh, the most common one is uh, cognitive bias. Um, I think there is a research that suggests that there are more than 175 different types of cognitive biases, and um, that's basically a, a deviation from the standards of judgment, uh, where you either create in- inferences, assessments, or, or perceptions that are actually unreasonable. Um, and you may also recollect past experiences incorrectly. So if you apply these kind of uh, cognitive biases uh, to a product, then your product, of course, is going, is going to suffer. Um, and also because they may dictate uh, the person's behavior or attitude uh, in a positive or a negative way. So, but in product, there are different, uh, also different uh, biases uh, based on data, based on processes, it depends on the framework. Like, unfortunately, product management is still not a discipline. Maybe likely, it's not like you get Prince II certification in project management. There is no, there are several approaches, but there is who uh, pushes for product market fit, who pushes more from a funnel standpoint, who pushes more like data-driven approach. So there are very different ones. Um, and I would say if you, like all these are biases. Like if you if you if you apply blindly a framework to a product simply because you studied it and it worked in your past experiences, then exactly where you you start uh, using cognitive bias plus a framework in in spaces that maybe are not uh, is not going to to get the outcome that you want. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so cognitive bias seems to be a big one and. I, you know, you mentioned a few ones like uh, product market fit, um, data driven. There's also like sales driven culture, right? <laughs> From like sure. a product standpoint, um, maybe we could focus on one. Um, let's talk about data driven. Um, yeah, it's it's one that I think some people that I've spoken to really kind of focus in on. Like they, they, they double click into that and they, you know, really get fascinated and, you know, sometimes like overwhelmed by what you could get out of it. Um, other people just kind of use it as like, just like, a, you know, it's there. Like it's not helping me make the, the final decision. Right. Um, it's just yeah. a reference point in, in your experience. And I know uh, you're currently working at type form and, you know, even in your past experience, like how much has data driven, biases uh uh impacted or positively or negatively um your product decision making process mm. well first let me um let's say address this thing about like data driven being a bias like for me um i'm not sure being data driven or data driven approach is is a bias um i mean in general, I don't like stating that someone is, is data-driven unless uh, they are a mathematician. 
uh, because what you should be is data aware. Um, that is different because honestly, also when it comes to hiring, right? I don't care if you have a technical background or not, simply because that depends on on, on the role, on the specific role I'm hiring for, or the team that is, that is needing that specific uh, thing. If it is for a technical PM, then yeah, of course, I expect a technical, probably a technical degree or at least a period of direct experience. Otherwise, I'm not I'm not specifically looking for that. Um, but being data aware is another thing. Data aware means that you need to be able to measure the performance of, of your product, the usage um, that your customers make of the, the features and overall the, the entire product. The funnel or the customer journey also is, is fundamental. And so understanding how to define a metric and follow up uh, on reaching it or not, it's, it's, it's crucial. You can't measure the performance of your pro. If you can't measure, let's say that, that the performance of your product, then you are just guessworking. So, um, yeah, I, I I agree. Like, if it is data driven sense that you should be just take decision based on the data, then it 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 uh, it brings me back to the to the bias. Um, because if you think that you can measure the future performance of uh, of your product based on past performance, then you are going to be uh, disappointed. Uh, that's not what uh, what happens. So usually, it's better to be data aware than data driven. Uh, because if you drive your decision just based on data, that's not enough. And you could just you could just reinforce a strategy that maybe worked two years ago. But guess what? Uh, the market has changed, and probably yeah, you can derive the data from, from there. But imagine that your product hasn't changed. Are you going to stick just on the data that you're tracking with your product? No, you shouldn't. Because then otherwise you're just, I don't know, you're just focusing on the same customers. Let's imagine you want to focus your next strategy on the customers that have the highest LTV lifetime value, because those are mainly the ones that are more profitable and they are that are stickier. Um, but then you're, you're basically, um, staying afloat with the same approach, you're not growing. So you always need to look at the market, uh, getting uh, in touch with the customer. So there is also quantity, qualitative analysis, not just quantity. So that's my, my, my take on it. And so just from like a, uh, from a data aware standpoint, like <clears throat> just, I'm just curious, like um, with some of the products, you are working on now or have worked on in the past, I'm sure there could be a lot of historical data points um, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, you getting access to it and trying to understand yep. how people are using product and or like, et cetera. Yes. Um, how can you effectively leverage those in order to make future decisions? I mean, you, you're only kind of getting historical data, right? Like it's yeah. things that's happened, of right? Of course. Like, yes. Um, how how does that help you impact um, your decision making process in terms of like future things to do? If you if you uh, so first of all, like you, you always need to use the data as a baseline, um, but uh, you need to first of all decision you know decide what's the vision, what's the added value proposition that you want to put up there, what is the cost the target customer base that you're after maybe you haven't done a good job. So you need to first, you know, having this uh, mission statement, vision, and a strategy. Then the data will help you understand wait, where, I am, where am I in the journey of winning my customers with my product? Um, because if the data tells you that the specific segment of customers that you're after have a higher churn than maybe another segment of population, then you're doing it wrong. And mm -hmm. then of course you need to correct the track. So then what you can do to steer towards the right vision is starting making some hypotheses. That means being data aware. So you need to make certain hypotheses and then you need to prove or disprove the hypothesis. Like A-B testing is just one of the, of the ways of, of, of doing that, right? Um, and hence, you can start experimenting 
and 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 checking the direction towards uh, your your objectives. So you can uh, you can test hypotheses, and it's safer than taking uh, assumptions for sure. Uh, it's also less riskier, right? Uh, so you need mm -hmm. to find in any case the right velocity, of course, to to execute that. Awesome. I uh, what are um, so we talked about cognitive biases? Like, are there any other are there any other types of biases that you've come across that uh, can impact good decision making? Um, yes, uh, I've seen lots of times confirmation bias, uh, and it's always the honestly, it's always the strongest one. Um, like people look for similar people, uh, like minded, like minded uh, ones. Um, there's no way. It's always it's always that kind of feeling, even you know on Zoom or any other. A digital channel. Uh, there is always a kind of we are looking for confirmation from from the other side or even from the data or from or from the product. Um, when it comes, for example, to to hiring, you often see very good candidates that are filtered out simply because the hiring manager can cannot establish a proper communication uh, with the candidate, and they immediately takes a defensive approach, and that's the worst possible attitude that you want to have. Uh, when you recruit, you need to think about First, the diversity of your team, and I'm not just talking about LGBT plus, that is really important. But I wish that was the only bias and discrimination out there. There are even, you know, more subtle ones that are even more basic. And the main one is culture. And this is something that in Europe, it's uh, it's common because we are, you know, we are not you. We speak uh, different languages. We are spread across different countries with different rules, with different uh, styles of, of living. And uh, in reality, I think that the responsibility of the recruitment stands on the on the hiring manager side, because um, what you need in your team is first of all what you want. Actually, you want different perspectives. If you mm -hmm. surround yourself only by yes people, you will never grow. So and so your product will never grow, um, because it needs to be appealed. Also, because if you think about it, like the product, even if the job to be done for product is the same, it needs always to appeal different typology of, of customers, customers of people. So ultimately it needs to, it needs to consider different perspective. Um, and the best way actually to avoid confirmation bias is to accept to be challenged, at least as a hiring manager, for example. I've hired very skilled PMs, uh, not alike PMs. Um, and uh, is the only worst outcome that you can get from hiring very diverse teams is that you improve yourself and the product. Interesting. Um, moving on to another kind of topic area I wanted to go through with you is around um, design thinking and prototyping uh, on the product mm -hmm. team. Uh, you've talked about it, I think, before when we had a chance to last connect. Um, and I want to kind of explore that a bit more because, you know, sometimes you have to make tough decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like how you go about something. So I wanted to just ask, you know, in your experience, how, how, can, a, how can a product team successfully go about um, or approach design thinking? Uh, well, design thinking uh, is very useful when it comes to the ideation phase uh, in, in teams. Um, how I approach it, uh, like for example, I consider myself a very creative uh, person. Um, yet I noticed that even for me, the, the moments I'm most creative is when I challenge my assumptions and I collaborate with the others. And that mm -hmm. reconnects to the, the diversity of your team, having different perspectives and above all, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of a safe environment where people can express themselves, otherwise they wouldn't be uh, represented. So uh, this way, honestly, you know, like having design thinking embedded in the way you collaborate with your teams is a way to ask questions and kill assumptions that are the ones that ultimately will, will weigh and for which you will pay a price in terms of product evolution. Um, for me, prototyping is not only a way actually to validate uh, a potential solution from different perspectives, but also to reduce, uh, as I mentioned, the risk in, in building something. Um, so for me, even before checking, you know, following a framework blindly, teams should first check each other's perspectives. 
that's like the, the ideation phase. And identify also the initial assumptions. Like if you can identify the initial assumptions of every team member, you can better understand the team member. And at the same time, you can avoid uh, falling into pitfalls uh, later on in the, in the design of, of your product. Mm -hmm. How, what, what's a good, what's a good exercise or uh, approach you've taken with your PMs in order to kind of like level check everybody's uh, assumption process, you know, <laughs> like, mm. you know, I'm just curious, like, you know, well, you get you a new start, team member yeah, and yeah. you know, you don't know what, how they think or how they would go about analyzing something. So oh, you involve them from day one and that's about inclusivity. Um, and that's why you want them since the beginning, you want, or you always want fresh perspectives. So, you know, you set up a board, whatever, if it's in the digital world or in the physical world, and you start putting, you know, you're asking questions and you get answers. And these answers, sometimes you actually get assumptions more from the, from the existing, from the people that are working in the team, because they are going to think kind of in the same direction while you're going to be challenged by new, new perspectives. And that is the most refreshing, uh, the most refreshing part. And then, uh, and then you, you actually see that. And that's why also, you know, different perspective and new people, new joiners actually can bring a new perspective and open, open the eyes in, in, in your brain uh, of the other team members. Okay, cool. Uh, last question, Manuel, before we get to the fire side, which is going to be those quick uh, answers. So you worked, you know, quite a bit in product. What's like the worst ever product or feature you ever had to deal with that you could share mm -hmm. with us and explain why you think it was the worst? I'm not going to tell no. It's, it's <laughs> I think it's coming from my uh, uh, kind of consultancy days, honestly, um, the consultancy in product, right? So um, probably it was a dashboard that was developed for a financial institution. Uh, so the product itself was a dashboard that some bankers had to consult. Um, it was a, it didn't go that well. Um, and what were, would I have done differently? Um, it's funny because I would have suggest using another framework completely, another framework and another software to get what the bankers wanted because the product and the schemas in that specific case that were developed were not fit for purpose. So they want to retrieve some data and like the schema was not flexible. It was just like, yeah, you know, using a bazooka to actually, you know, to move a, to move a needle. Like it, it didn't make any sense. And that's another important lesson in product. Like sometimes you need to take bold decisions as, as we mentioned before and leave an unsuccessful path to start over. And this happens, happens honestly so many times. Uh, like users need solutions to problems, not tools or products. And the most, the worst thing that you can find is like having products that have been pre-selected and then you need to adjust them uh, to meet uh, the customer needs. That's the worst, like, because then you, you're just trying to fit the product that maybe was, you know, uh, conceived uh, for a specific purpose in, in a different way, in a way that doesn't, uh, doesn't match the, the needs of the, of the customer. And also, like, why should you build something if you can seek alternatives or substitutes? Like, before you start creating anything in product, every one of us in product should always think about the substitute competitions that are out there. Always remember, like you're not going into the market with the product, always to compete with someone else. Often you compete with a substitute, with maybe free alternatives. Um, so it doesn't, does it make sense building something from scratch? You know, uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no, because building is expensive and reusing is cheap. And uh, from different types of reuse and mix and match, you can actually create something new without the need to start from scratch. We started, uh, you, you started uh, uh, you know, the introduction talking about product innovation. Innovation comes from, from this process. Uh, innovation comes from mixing and matching different solutions and putting them together to solve maybe a new problem. You know, mm -hmm. think about it. Like how many, how many consumers and businesses use just one applications to solve their problems? I would say not so many. The multiple times we refer to multiple products to solve one more complex problem. Like think about like even, like even on, my, uh, on the mobile, how many applications do we use? And that work, 
how many tech stack software do we have in our company to do to basically live our and to do our, our daily job um, and that actually is the perfect opportunity to, to create something new because um, there is a gap uh, using if there is a gap like you can't do something or you need like three three four different products to achieve a workflow or a business process um, you know using multiple solution is expensive and usually the experience sucks so if you're able to actually introduce one unique way and one uh, one product that can fit multiple tests then probably you are up onto something uh, something interesting something in, uh, innovative in, in the market I'm a, I'm a big, big fan of uh, using off-the-shelf solutions to uh, solve maybe an MVP problem instead of trying to build some build one. I think in a, in a, I think in my final point on this before we jump to the fireside stuff is sure. there is I think every technology, every solution for the most part has already been done like in today's time like there's sure. just so much stuff out there you might not know about it, but it probably exists, right? So, sure. um, I I really agree with you that you know when working on the solution, it should really fit your user's need, not you know not anybody else's. So, I think that would be my main message I want to get out to who's ever listening is like, do your analysis, see what other um, solutions already exist, competitors or you know like similar like or like solutions and see if you could just use those right instead of trying to build something yeah um or review first of all review like even 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 higher level like are like you're using something to solve a problem like first question is what are you trying to do mm -hmm. because maybe you're already using the wrong pro <laughs> the, the wrong product. exactly exactly all right uh before we wrap up i love doing these fireside uh questions okay. so they're Sure. Uh, short questions, short answers. Okay, try to try to keep it down to a couple a couple sentences. It's always sure. hard, but uh, let's, let's do this. All right. Uh, first question is: uh, What product? Um, what what should people in products start doing tomorrow to ship mm -hmm. better solutions? Um, to ship better solutions. Um, well. You know, I'm thinking about actually, I, I'm thinking uh, from another standpoint, like uh, what should be, you know, the best product for the future, uh, next big thing. Um, and, and in my opinion, it should be a real metaverse for remote working at this point. Metaverse for um, remote working, okay. Yeah, because again, yeah, too many tools to handle the communication and productivity. I think the next big winner will be the one introducing the platform where you can spend your remote, uh, your remote working day on. Okay. And what aspects of product development money can't fix? Money can't fix bad quality and poor experience derived from wrong assumptions. You can throw the money you want, but if you haven't done the proper due diligence in advance about the why and the what, then you're doomed. So true. Uh, now, this question is more tied to like um, the amount of uh, user input you want to get when building out a product. So at what point do you ask users what uh, they want you to build for uh, their solution and when not to do that? Well, to be honest with you, like given where I started from, I see this very often in consultancy on the services side. Um, also in that case, you need to ensure that the customer gets what they need and not just what they want, what they're asking for. Although in that case, if you're in consultancy, you might build more if that happens. So maybe, maybe it's good. But absolutely not in SaaS products where the user does not match the profile of the ICP around which you build your strategy. Like if it doesn't match that, think twice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, at what point uh, can you throw money at a product problem? Um, with a problem with the when you have properly validated the product market fit and to beat competition on time to market and alternatives. Okay, awesome. And uh, this was an interesting one. I like asking what what do people uh, what do people believe? Uh, sorry, what do other people believe that you th that is insane that you do? Um, 
I think that people believe uh, that he's insane, whatever they don't understand. What, whatever they don't understand? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, advice to 30-year-old self? Take it easy. The world is not going to end tomorrow. And invo- invest more in yourself than in your uh, five, uh, you know, nine to five daily job. Okay. Now, sorry, let me rephrase my last question. What hmm. do you believe that other people think is insane? What I believe that other people think is insane. People usually think that what they don't understand is insane. Okay. Because they jump to conclusion. See what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, last question. What would you want to accomplish? Uh, what might you do to accomplish your 10 year goals in the next six months if you had like a gun to your head or you had no more time left to do something? I would simply reset uh, my expectations. <laughs> I like that one. Awesome. Um, any final parting words, Manuel, to the audience that you want to that you want to share? I I would say, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I think anyone that wants to to discuss any of the topics or about product management, product innovation, can reach out to me also on LinkedIn or directly through you. I will be glad to have this kind of conversation. I've done also some mentorship and doing some mentorship every now and then. So happy to happy to contribute to the product management world. Awesome. Yeah, I'll uh we'll we'll uh when we share the episode, we'll tag you and uh, uh find a way to get people to reach out to you directly as well. So thank you, Manuel. It was a pleasure having you on our show today. Uh thank you for thank coming you. and sharing your uh wealth of knowledge and uh, to all of our listeners thank you again for always tuning in and supporting us